Now that you've understood about conversation consent generally in the part one video, let's talk about how to apply it in conversations. We do something that you may not have heard of, but you're probably very familiar with. It's called checking in for reciprocity. If you've ever walked into a cafeteria and seen someone sitting there and wanted to sit down and eat with them, chances are you checked in for reciprocity. That is, you checked in for cues as to whether they wanted to eat with you or not, or whether they preferred to be alone. Same when you talk to someone on a train. You begin a conversation and gauge the level of interest. If this is not a skill that you find easy, or if you just think it would be better, you may just want to straight up ask. For example, you might want to say something like, I'd like to talk about X. Are you open to having a conversation about it? Or I recently read an article on X and it got me thinking about why. Are you open to having a chat about it? Let's look at how this works in three different situations. One, one-to-one -one conversations. Two, conversations in groups and three, where there are power imbalances. One-to-one -one conversations. In a one-to-one -one conversation, if one person doesn't want to talk about a topic, they shouldn't have to. Check in for reciprocity when you want to broach a more challenging topic. You will know that different people have different tolerance levels. Some people will almost always be up for a challenging conversation on any topic, and others will find it harder. Get to know people and their tolerance levels. In general, when someone doesn't want to talk about a topic, respect that. There may, however, be some situations where you feel it's important to you to have a more difficult conversation with someone who seems not to want one perhaps in a closer relationship. At some point, you may want to make a stronger request, probably not for an immediate conversation, but for that conversation to be had at some point. You might say something like, for example, listen, I know you don't seem keen on talking to me about X, but it's really important to me and it would mean a lot to me because of Y, whatever that reason is. Would you be willing to have a think about it and see if there's a way you would be willing to talk about X with me at some point? Because I think it would be really important and help our relationship or something else about whatever the positive impact you think would be. Things get more complicated in group settings and with power imbalances. So let's look at small group settings next. On a sensitive topic in a group, you might want to check in. And if not everybody wants to talk about a topic, then take a decision about what to do next. Conversation consent is about finding solutions that work. Not everybody needs to feel extremely happy about the solution, but no one should feel forced or stuck in a conversation they want to get out of. Maybe the whole group wants to have the conversation, and that's an easy one. But if not, you have a number of options. Do you separate the group for this conversation or do you not talk about it? It's not a given that a whole group should not talk about something because one person doesn't want to. That might be the decision, particularly if there's someone new to the group who doesn't know everyone yet. But it also might be that enough people want to have the conversation so the group will separate for that moment to have the conversation, not forever, just for a bit. However you do this, it's important to do your best to make decisions kindly and respectfully. And of course, you wouldn't want someone to feel rejected. It's about balancing the importance of people being able to talk about a topic they want to talk about with each other when they do consent, which is a part of the fundamental right of freedom of speech, with being respectful to people who might have a hard time talking about that topic. You don't have to shut down every conversation. Neither should you force someone to have a conversation they don't want to have. The main thing is that you're never forced and everyone feels like they matter. So now let's look at the situation of power imbalance. At the most basic level, we've just looked at one of those situations where someone is new to the group, there's a power imbalance 
in that the new person is not likely to feel the strength of belonging and trust that others might feel in the group. They also might not know or understand the culture of the group. Every group, every room has a culture which includes underlying rules and the person coming into that group new doesn't have all of that information. Work or school or university are places where some people have more authority than others and there can be power imbalances. But watch out because power and authority don't always go together in the way that you would think. I know some very accomplished leaders in organization who've been bullied by their team members, for example. Let's look at the direction we normally expect this to come in from people who have authority, whilst being aware that groups have a lot of power. Someone in a position of authority might imagine that someone will feel comfortable to leave a conversation if they want to, but they might in fact not. And then it starts to get more complicated. So this needs to be navigated skillfully with the person with more authority being aware that the person who has less authority might not feel comfortable expressing their desire not to be part of a conversation. They may fear that if they say no, there would be consequences, including potentially losing their job. So even if they say yes, it may be hard to be sure that there is truly consent, that they have genuinely consented to having that conversation, especially where those conversations involve questions of identity. Skillful navigation is required. In these cases, it may be good to have conversations facilitated by an impartial mediator so that the person with less authority feels more secure within the power dynamic. That will depend on the situation and how serious the conversation is. Awareness of the organization's culture and understanding how that person might feel is also important. It may be better to avoid raising some topics connected with identity and only discussing them if the person with less authority brings them up. We have a tendency to avoid difficult feelings. I would always recommend leaning into feelings of discomfort that arise in conversation. That's where the magic happens. We tend to avoid those feelings, but there's a lot of information in them that can help us navigate challenging situations more skillfully. Obviously, it's also important to make sure that leaders foster a culture where their teams feel that they can bring up any issues that arise and that they'll be taken seriously and dealt with appropriately by the leader or the proper channels within the organization. A culture where everyone feels respected. There are situations where a lot of caution would be needed. And there are other situations where it would actually be okay to require someone in a work context to participate in a discussion where they do feel uncomfortable. This might be things that would be reasonably expected of the people in their job. For example, if you're in sales, your job could involve cold calling. That might make you feel uncomfortable. It would definitely make me feel uncomfortable. But it might be reasonable to expect you to make cold calls if that's part of your job. If there's a conflict in the office, it might be reasonable to require you to participate in some form of mediated discussion. And it might be reasonable to ask you to participate in some form of diversity training where topics like identity might be discussed. I hope this has given you some things to think about. There are many nuances to conversation consent, but the most important things to remember are I matter, and you matter, whoever you are and however much you disagree with me. And no one should be forced to talk about something they don't want to talk about. This requires that everyone learns skills to manage their feelings when they can't have a conversation they want to have. And also that we learn to feel sufficiently empowered to speak up or simply walk away when we feel that a conversation is not right for us. If you want to stay up to date with new releases on the Disagreeing Well Skills course, please subscribe to UCL's YouTube channel and also to UCL's Minds newsletter.